So we all know Father Tim has cats. He has three cats. One of them is a tuxedo. It's a very pretty cat. Uh, the devil's beautiful as well. He can appear in angelic form, you know, to deceive humanity and try to consume souls. So also Tony is a very pretty cat. And Tony's also not the cle cleverest of cats. He, he's afraid of everything. Uh, I have never done anything mean to this cat. The other cats, not so much. I've never done anything mean to Tony. The other cats will come up and, 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 and you know, look for attention. Tony runs away from me no matter what I do. Now, this cat, when I was in Athens with Father Tim, and they just got Tony, and he was about the size of a teacup, uh, he would come and sit in my lap in the mornings when I would say my office. We had this wonderful relationship. It was great. And then he grew up like a teenager, and now he hates me. But Tony, in the evening, when the evening food service is about to begin, um, he gets a little frantic. I have a, this cuckoo clock that was a wonderful gift given to me. Uh, Father Tim hates it because it reminds him of some evil priest in the seminary. Um, but it goes off right before the feeder goes off. And we've all heard of Pavlov's experiment with the dog, right? So, so as 6 o'clock starts to roll around, uh, Tony starts to like get his shakes and he needs to, you know, he's missing something. And, and then the cuckoo clock goes off. Now the cuckoo clock is in what would be the garage of the, of the house. The feeder is in a completely different side of the house. That cuckoo clo clock goes off and he bolts from wherever he is into where the cuckoo clock is. The cuckoo clock doesn't feed him, but he goes there anyways, as if going to the cuckoo clock is going to trigger the food, he goes to the cuckoo clock and goes and eats. Now, the cuckoo clock has not been there very long. So Tony's been eating from the feeder for a long time, disassociated completely with the cuckoo clock. This is the definition of superstition, by the way. Running to the cuckoo clock, hoping, hoping that the food you know, goes, right? Something disassociated. Now, why do I tell you this? I tell you this because last night when he did this ridiculous thing that, he, that he's so inclined to do, I thought to myself, I was like, this must be how my guardian angel looks at me. It's like, why are you so dumb? You know, why, why do you do this thing? Why don't you understand? You know, I told you Tony's afraid of me. And I'm like, Tony, I just want to pet you. I'm not, I've never hurt you before. I, I've only ever done good things to you, right? My angel's like, why do you keep rebelling against me? I've only done good things for you, right? These angels had the similar experience with the men of Galilee at the Ascension. Remember the scene. Jesus, the apostles, they're walking around. Everything is wonderful for them. Jesus, their Lord, who, who died, is, is risen again. They've got him back. The plan can go forward, whatever they un understood that plan to be. Their hope is not in vain, after all. Jesus is talking to them, and they're like, hey, are we going to do the thing now? Are you going to restore Israel now? Are we, are we going to get to the, get to, to the plan? And Jesus is like, slow your roll there. That is not for you to worry about. There are a few things for you to worry about, but that's not for you to worry about. And then he starts to ascend. And they're like, wait a minute. You just got you back. Where are you going? And they're looking up in the sky, and the angels are looking at him like, you dolts. Why are you looking at the sky? This is part of the plan. You, how can you be so dense? You don't get it. Right now, obviously, the angels have amazing, like, I mean, they understand all this stuff. They understand what God is doing, right? The, the disciples, the apostles don't. They have a very narrow view. They still think Jesus is there to restore the kingdom of Israel. Jesus doesn't care about Israel, despite what every Protestant in the United States thinks, right? This is not the, the issue. What does Jesus say? He says, I have work for you to do. Now, here's the thing. The angels were, in a sense, chastising the apostles. They were trying to encourage them, get them to go. Go do the work that Jesus just gave you to do. Don't worry about the political thing. Don't worry about what you were expecting. Go and do the thing Jesus told you to do. Go do the work. And the apostles, so close to Jesus' ascension, they were just waiting there, like, like Tony and Frank and Claire at the feeder, just waiting for it to go off, because they know it's going to go off any minute. Jesus is going to come back any minute, 
right? Paul's letters uh, often indicate this. He's like, don't worry about sowing. Don't worry about harvesting. Don't worry about milling your grain. Don't worry about getting married. Don't worry about... Because Jesus is right around the corner. He's going to come back any, any, any minute now, right? And so being so close to the ascension of Jesus, they were in anticipation of his return to the point that they weren't quite wanting to go and do the work. We don't want to leave because what if he comes back? We don't want to go do the thing because this is where he left and the angel said he's going to come back the same way, so we should just wait right, wait right here. Could you, imagine, <laughs> could you imagine they're all sitting in a circle 15 years later still waiting for Jesus to look it up at the sky? But the angels sent him off. Now here's the thing. This was their kind of silly behavior that the angels had to wake them up about. Hey, hey, yeah, he's going to come back, but you, you've got work to do. Go, go, go do the work, right? Don't, don't worry about him when he's going to come back or not. We have a different issue. We don't think he's ever going to come back. Many of us don't think that he even came in the first place, right? And so for us, we have the danger of growing weary, sleepy, we have the danger of becoming distracted by the allurements of this world, of judging things by the expectations and the standards of this world, because we're so far away, removed from the, the, the ascension of Jesus, that we're like, 2,000 years, I don't think he's going to come back tomorrow. He may, right? And this is, this is, our, this is the dangerous temptation for us. And, the, and what the, the celebration of the ascension every year provides us is a little bit of a wake-up call. Hey, how you doing? If Jesus came back at the end of this Mass, how, how would you do? You ready to see him? Now, we live our lives each and every day, or we should live our lives each and every day, memento mori, remembering death. We have this wonderful skull here at the bottom of St. Francis, not some wolf and a bird on his shoulder or none of that nonsense. We have, we have a skull. Why? Why a skull? Because we need to remember that we are mortal and that at any moment Jesus could come back, whether he comes back in glory with trumpets and swords and angels and horses, or whether he comes back in the sense that we die and we go to see him ourselves, that it could happen at any moment. We need to live our lives asking the question, hey, how am I doing? Am I, am I friends with Jesus right now? Or have I, have I kind of betrayed him? I'm not his friend. Have I been ignoring him? Have I forgotten? Have I not been doing the work that he left me to do? Remember the, the parables, several parables he told, as a matter of fact, about talents and about accounting or being accountable. Here's grace. I've given you grace. What have you done with my grace? When Jesus comes back, he's going to say that to you. He's not going to say, hey, what college did you get into? He's not going to say, hey, how were your grades? He's not going to say, hey, did you get that promotion? No, you didn't. Oh. He's not going to say, how's your 401k? Have you been responsible with your money? No. He's going to say, where are the souls that I have given to you to help me save? Where are they? Are they with you? Or did you forget about them? Where is the fruit of the grace I gave you in the Spirit? Have you made good on it? Or have you been distracted? Have you been looking at your life as successful in this world? Or have you allowed yourself to fail a bit in this world to be successful for the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's going to ask us when he comes again. And we need to remember that he has gone away to prepare a place for us. And when he comes back, he's going to have an accounting for us. That's not some horrible thing. I mean, it could be, I guess, if you're afraid of him coming back, right? A, a, a Christian who loves Jesus shouldn't be afraid of him coming back. Right? Everybody else in the world is going to be like, ah, run right away. They're going to hide in caves and they're going to like get into submarines and go deep into the ocean, try to hide from Jesus. Christians are not afraid of him coming back. Catholic Christians are not afraid of him coming back. Right? We don't have to be if we're his friend. Right? But there will be an accounting. He's going to ask us, how did you live your life? Did you do the work I gave you to do? And this is an important question. We first have to understand where we stand in the balance of this dangerous risk. We're far away from Jesus' ascension, but we may be very close to his return. So while we don't necessarily have the temptation of the apostles to sit on a cushion and be patient for him to come back because it's going to be any moment now, and to forget or to not do the work that he gave us to do, right? 
But we do have to be aware of this other, this other fear, this other um, temptation, excuse me. That's the worst. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's it, I'm done. Temptations, right? So we have, to prepare, we have to defend ourselves against the temptation of becoming distracted and evaluating the purpose and the, and the work of life to have to do with this world. What school did you go to? What sports did you play? What scholarships did you get? What job do you have? What, how well did you do in that job? How's your retirement? Are you comfortable? I mean, are you, are you wasting your, I mean, what are you doing with your retirement? Are you, are you being uh, merciful? Are you, are you, are you, are you work, spending your life coming to know, love, and serve the Lord? Or, or are you now just sitting back on your laurels and, 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 and wasting your time and your money, right? But the other thing is this. We have to make sure we know what the work is that Jesus gave us to do in the first place. He did not say, yes, now we're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Jesus doesn't care about the, the nation of Israel. I mean, he kind of does in the sense that he, he respects nations. But in the same way, he doesn't care about the United States. He doesn't care about Australia. He doesn't care about Russia. He doesn't care about Ukraine. He doesn't care about Argentina. He doesn't care about Canada. Certainly doesn't care about Canada. He cares about the souls that he came to unite to himself. And each one of those souls that he has united to himself through baptism and confirmation and Holy Communion have their own responsibility, their own work to do. St. Paul talks about the body of Christ growing into the full stature of manhood, a maturity in Christ Jesus. This means that every member of the body, every part, every, every appendage, every cell is strong and mature and is able to do the work that it needs to do. And what work is that? Jesus says, as the Father sends me, so I send you. And in order to do that work, he says, I breathe on you my Holy Spirit. Now next week we're going to celebrate the Pentecost and that empowering, right? It's the, it's the soul that impregnates the body. And what we celebrate today is the ascension of that body. Now let me ask you something. Is it a good thing for the head and the body to be separated? What happens when that happens? Death. Is Jesus dead or alive? So if his head ascended, what has his body also done or is doing? Ascending. I'll give you an example of this. I pick up my nephews by their ears. Have you ever done that? I wouldn't recommend it. They don't have ears anymore. Um, no, so I, I, I do this, this game with my nephews where I, I come and I grab them on either side of the head. And, uh, and then they, gra they grab my wrists, right? And then I, I just, I lift them up. And it's fun, because they're, they're, you know, they're looking at me in the eyes, and they feel tall, and they're hanging on, they feel strong, it's wonderful, it's a great boy thing. I, wouldn't, I don't know that the girls appreciate it all that much, but the boys love it. That's, that's a, in a sense, what happens with, with Jesus, his body. He, he took on flesh, he took on a body. The second person of the Trinity descended, took on flesh so that our flesh could be part of his flesh. Right? So that we're one, we're inseparable, so that we're commingled. We, we no longer are simply humans any more than he's simply a human, but we share in his divinity as he is properly divine. Right? So when that head goes up, Jesus, who is the head of the body, ascends to heaven, so also do all of its members, the members of that body, go up. With, that's how we get to heaven, by the way, guys, if you didn't know that. We don't climb a staircase, we don't climb a ladder, we don't climb a mountain. We ascend in the body of Jesus, which ascends. That's why there's no other way to get to heaven than in Jesus, right? No other way, none. Zero other ways, because he's the only one that goes to heaven. Jesus is the only one who ascends to heaven. Who ascends to heaven but the one who is first descended from heaven? We heard the scripture say, Jesus the Christ. So we ascend to heaven as well by being a member of his body. If we're not a member of his body, it doesn't matter how, how cute and cuddly you are, it doesn't matter how sentimental things get, if you're not a member of his body, you don't ascend with him to heaven. You don't go to heaven. Right? So the first thing that we need to do as human beings, the job that Jesus says is you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So we need to enter into the life of the church, the body of Christ through the sacraments, but then we have more job to do, more work to do that he gives us. And it's wonderful. He says, go out to all the nations and proclaim the good news. 
teach them about me and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the end of Matthew rather than the end of, of uh, the gospel that we read today. Right? This is the work that he's given us to do. He didn't say go out and get a good job. If you're failed at this life, if you failed at this life, if you're, if, if you're you know, failed at this life, so to speak, if you're poor, you get, you get fired, you can't keep a job, you, you struggle with, you struggle with, with either physical or, 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 or mental disabilities, you just, your, your whole life is just spent trying to struggle with that and struggle faithfully, and you don't have this huge expanse of life before you, if that's where you are, but you're filled with good works and charity towards your neighbor, well done, man, you've won life. If you're rich and you recognize and remember that the riches you get in this life are not the evaluation of your success as a human being, but is an opportunity, it is your capacity to do good, and you're filled with good works, well done. You won life. Not because you're rich, but because you're good. Because you're united to Christ. Because you're virtuous. That's winning life, y'all. That's the work God gave us to do. And so while we, not men of Galilee, but men of Georgia, men and women of, of, of Ackworth, Stand and worship God. Let us not do so passively as the men of Galilee standing and looking at the sky. Let us not fall into the trap of apathy and complacency and distraction as men and women removed from the ascension 2,000 years. But let us live as Christians, aware that Christ has come. Christ will come again. And in the meantime, all we have to do is show ourselves to be his good friends to do the work he's given us to do, to live our lives, to live lives of virtue and charity and mercy and justice and goodwill towards all, and to obey him and to live in his body, the church, through the life of the sacraments, so that as he has gone away to prepare a place for us and will come again, when he does, he will take us to himself, so that wherever he is, we also shall be.